So my name is Tom Coleman, and I um, accidentally forgot to turn the recorder on partway through Seth's presentation uh, the other night. So uh, to make up for that, what I've done is uh, I've uh, put up the slides here in this uh, particular video. And based on my notes, I've tried to go through some of the slides and uh, indicate what, what he said. And then I'll also uh, turn on the actual video at the point where it does start recording. So you get a sense of the whole presentation. I hope it's helpful. It's the best I could do considering the situation. So let's uh, go ahead and uh, share the screen and uh, get going. All right, so what we have here is uh, climate disruption, what we can do, September 15, 2022, climate reality, Chicago uh, Metro chapter, where uh, this is the member meeting. Uh, we introduce uh, Seth Darling as the Interim Associate uh, Director for Advanced Energy and Technologies at Argonne National Laboratory. He also serves as Director of Advanced Material for uh, Energy Water Systems and Energy Frontier Research Center. Uh, he received his PhD in physical chemistry from University of Chicago. His group's research centers around molecular engineering with a current emphasis on advanced materials for cleaning water. He has published over 150 scientific articles, holds nearly 20 patents, um, and uh, is co-author of popular books on water and on debunking climate skeptic myths. Seth lectures widely on topics related to energy water and climate. And we're just absolutely thrilled uh, that we can uh, have uh, Seth at our meeting today. So without uh, ado, um, Seth was uh, started talking at this point. I'll do my best to make up for the beginning and, and then turn it into Seth when the recording will uh, start. So with that saying, um, he started talking about this picture here, which would be the climate, uh, I'm sorry, which would be uh, ice cores which are drilled typically in uh, Greenland, South America, and so forth, deep, deep down in the ground and be, be able to take the cores out of the ground. They kind of look like this. And each layer of the core that's extracted from the ground, uh, from the ice, uh, is one year. And you can see the little bubbles uh, in the ice core. And each of these bu bubbles represent the, the atmosphere that existed at the time, uh, in many cases, hundreds of thousands of years ago. So the scientists can really study what the uh, atmosphere was like at, you know, way back in time. The other thing too, is that um, they can, so they, when they track it, they actually measure the CO2. So you can see in the year 1000, you can see we're at about 280 parts per million of uh, carbon dioxide. And it was around there for a long period of time. And in fact, dipped around 1600 and then started to dramatically increase in the late 1800s into the 1900s. And the picture represents what happened at that time. And of course, that was the Industrial Revolution, where we started to do things that polluted the atmosphere, not only pollution, but of course, greenhouse gases and methane and so forth. So today, since uh, today, they can be more accurate with this. Uh, since 1958, we have uh, direct uh, daily uh, direct air measurements that can, can measure it, such as this uh, uh, facility on the top of Mauna Loa in uh, Hawaii. Um, this uh, plot that you see on the left, which I showed you before, can now on the right be uh, more accurate in terms of ups and downs in very short periods of time. And then Seth showed us this chart, which merges those two previous charts into one chart to really give you perspective of what it was like in the year 1000 with around 280 parts per million in what has happened as we escalated from the Industrial Revolution, 310, and on up to about 420 parts per million. Now, in these ice cores, they can actually go back, as I mentioned, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and you can see back 800,000 uh, uh, 800, years ago, you can see that actually the stability of Earth's atmosphere has been pretty, pretty good, around 280, you know, maybe maximum uh, 300 parts per million, and very consistent. Ups and downs, sure, but uh, very consistent. But you can see as you as we approach today, year zero, how it's gone up here to 340 parts per million. And now today we're actually up here at 400, 420 parts per million. The chart on the top left kind of summarizes the, uh, the blue line being the uh, parts per million and the dots being the temperature anomaly that, that has occurred. 
And then the chart at the bottom left shows the melting ice as a result of the warming of the planet. And you can see how uh, land, uh, melting uh, land ice has dramatically dropped over time since 2002 to 2020, just 20 years. And, and what has happened is uh, the melting uh, ice um, raises the ocean, ocean uh, level. It raises it as well as the warming of the water causes it to be bigger, just like he uses in the analogy of a, of a balloon. If you were to heat the air in a balloon, the balloon would get bigger and then burst. So that's kind of what's happening with the ocean. It's getting bigger because of the melting uh, land ice, as well as the fact that it's heating. So the trends are clear, and he was pretty emphatic, uh, emphasizing these three major things, the rising sea level, the, the melting land ice, the rising global temperature in conjunction with the rising parts per million of uh, carbon dioxide. So then he wanted to talk, then he talked about the, the options, uh, mitigation, adaptation, and ge geoengineering. So let's take them one at a time. No matter what we do here, because of what's already there, let alone what we're adding every day, what's already there, we have to adapt. We have to plan for the impacts, build resiliency, and improve response uh, capacity. As you can see, this, uh, these homes, the beautiful homes, uh, they're trying to uh, build a seawall here because the ocean's uh, getting pretty mean, pretty high. And uh, so we have to spend billions of dollars to do that or else the homes are swept away, et cetera. So that's uh, adaptation, critical, must do, can't fail. Then uh, there's geoengineering. Now he's not so bullish on geoengineering, although he does believe that some really have to be focused on you can see the list of things that try and absorb CO2, such as planting forest. He didn't spend a lot of time on that, but obviously that's very important. Um, the accelerating uh, rock weathering, all these kinds of things. But he really focused on capturing CO2. On the bottom, deploying space mirrors and other things. Uh, you know, He politely seemed to indicate that a lot of this was just frankly crazy. And in fact, dangerous in that it is um, unintended consequences from doing some of these things. So uh, anyway, his emphasis was on capturing CO2 from the air. He feels it absolutely has to be done. And we can be critical of carbon capture success so far, but we've really got a problem. And it's not just the emissions, it's what's already there and we've got to capture some of that or else. With that said, he, 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 this is a picture of what was the largest carbon capture plant in 2021. And, uh, and, and that had a capacity of 4,000 tons of CO2 per year. <clears throat> That's called the Orca plant. And then the world's largest carbon capture plant right now in 2022 is this one here, which is called Tata. And it's uh, just way more powerful at 40,000 uh, tons of CO2 per year. Uh, the trouble with that is our global annual emissions are 36 billion. 400 million tons of CO2. I mean, turn that into pounds. It's just a, a staggering number. And we would need basically a million Tata plants just to handle our current annual emissions. And that wouldn't even draw down emissions. So we've got to do this. Must do, can't fail. Uh, we've got to expand it, more R&D, et cetera. But uh, we really got to get into uh, mitigation. Uh, so uh, before I get into that, um, uh, what do we do with this captured carbon? So he was suggesting that it can be captured. Unfortunately, we're gonna to have to have carbon pipelines. They're being planned for Southern Illinois, I believe he said. There's a deep saline aquifer, uh, aquifer in Southern Illinois and in different places around the country where you can put the carbon into those aquifers and it'd be pretty safe as long as the, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, there isn't, you know, uh, earthquakes and, and different other types of disruptions because it can't get out. Once it's here, it, it just can't get out. So that's, you know, pretty serious stuff to bury it down there. And uh, on the left, you see a kind of a picture of the United States showing that there are many of these sed sedimentary basins in saline uh, pools underneath the water, underneath the ground, which could capture this. Also, on the left side, he shows the uh, uh, we can transform some of it into polymers, fuels, calcium carbonate, cement, and uh, feedstock chemicals. And uh, 
we're on the road to success, but there isn't any shortcuts. This is re really out of time. It's a pretty serious issue. We're crashing into buildings type of thing right now. So let's get to kind of the meat of his presentation, the mitigation. We need to reduce the emissions, period. I mean, we got to do this thing. And uh, his PowerPoint slide uh, showed this a little, excuse me, a little bit differently, but I'll explain it. In the bottom, we have coal. And you can see that the prediction from the EIA, uh, Energy Information Agency, shows that here in 2022, uh, between now and 2050, it looks like coal is going to continue, if anything, to ramp up slightly, which, of course, we don't want to have happen. Natural gas, I'm sorry, oil is doing a similar thing. Um, natural gas, you can see, has gotten bigger and continue to get bigger. And you can see uh, nuclear power maybe expanded a little bit, but not much. And certainly the good news is the renewables that are you know, fairly small here are going to get to be fairly big out here, according to the EIA. The problem of this, this is far too small. And if you look at this carefully, you can see, don't, don't look at the shading, just make believe the shading went away, um, which is his PowerPoint. Um, you can see that demand for energy is, you know, terawatts type of a thing. It's just absolutely enormous all the time. So our demand for power is just going right through the roof. So the good news is that uh, renewable energy is really helping out. The bad news is fossil fuels are continuing to go up slightly. And then, so really bad. So in the picture, he's showing that we've got to go from this with the green uh, bar, uh, green area, the renewables, and we've got to get it all the way down to here. Basically, he's saying we need 20 terawatt, terawatts of renewables by 2050. Pretty dramatic. And so and now he discussed um, carbon emissions by countries, showing um, the United States here. Um, China, which was not historically a big emitter, but of course has been since 2000, it's been going right up. And they passed this probably, I don't know, around uh, 20, 2005 or so. And then you can see they're the biggest emitter in the world. But uh, he tries to show you a perspective of the carbon emissions per capita, which shows that uh, the United States is by far on a per capita basis, the greater, the greatest emitter on earth. And you can see that, um, China, China here is you know, way down here on a per capita basis. Uh, the biggest emitter, but on a per person basis, per capita basis, not so much. So yeah, it's us. And if we look at the cumulative emissions, which is not in either one of these charts, it shows the 420 parts per million and how that built up over time, you'd see that the United States is by far the greatest emitter. So, but there's a glimmer of hope. And the good news is so between now and 2020, between, I'm sorry, 1990 and 2020, as our GDP has increased, which is you know, a good thing, uh, you can see that the emissions from production-based uh, CO2 and, I'm sorry, consumer-based, consumption-based CO2 and production-based CO2 has dropped. So as uh, business and GDP has increased, emissions have actually in proportion gone down. It's still huge and a problem, but it is kind of a glimmer of hope is what Seth was saying. Now, he wants, at this point, he talks about the feasible limits. So if we look at fossil fuels here and how big it is, nuclear, fission, biomass, wind, and all these other forms, uh, not counting nuclear fusion, because it's really not anywhere. And look at it in perspective today, you can see the gray would be fossil fuels. And then you can see nuclear fission and some of these others in the boxes, okay? So you can see how small, wind is. Here's wind right here. Um, now, if we look out into the future and say, when, what will it be like when his son is middle-aged? So basically, the, he, by 2050, we have to be net zero, right, or else? Well, we're going to need 31 terawatts by that time. And if you were to put these things up here in perspective in the box, this is what it would look like. Now, for those, those of you listening that look at this and say, no, wait a minute, something's missing here. Solar is missing. So let's look at that and say that this stone age didn't end because we ran out of stones. I guess his inference here is the fossil fuel industry isn't going to end because we ran out of fossil fuels. It's just got to end. And so this picture here as we go forward um, without solar, 
we have to really say, what would solar do to help the situation? So solar, uh, so renewables aren't enough, right? And so basically they are enough. So we get to the point here where we look at the perspective of solar and we're about to turn this uh, presentation, we turn it over to Seth because the recording begins about here. And, uh, but very quickly, the total striking land ocean is 96 terawatts of energy, how big that is or what. Then the land area, if you just say, well, you can't count the oceans, just count the land areas and what it would look like. And then Seth will discuss how much of it over land, how much, how, how much efficiency do you get out of it? So let's now uh, go over to um, uh, Seth's presentation. A number that is what is the actual reasonable, feasible amount of energy that we could get from solar energy. And the first thing I'm gonna do is throw out the oceans. We're not gonna cover the oceans with solar panels for all kinds of reasons, that's not practical. So just land area, we end up with a smaller circle than we started to. But of course you also can't cover all of the land area with the solar panels. What is a reasonable and feasible amount of land area that you could cover? I'm gonna say 2% of the land is a reasonable amount of land that you could cover with solar panels. To give you a sense for 2%, Roads in the United States cover roughly 2% of the land. So we've already covered 2% of the land with something uh, you know, made by humans, it just isn't solar panels. 2% of the United States would look something like this. Uh, we're not gonna put all the solar panels in Southern Illinois, although we may put some of them there. That's just a, a, a box to show you what we're talking about when we say 2%. Now there's another challenge though here, which is that you cannot convert sunlight to electricity with 100% efficiency. There are fundamental losses in the process of converting sunlight into electricity. If you have panels on your roof today, or if you were to buy them today, you would get a power conversion efficiency of about 20%. That's kind of the, the state of the art in solar panels available on the market today. I'm gonna to be more conservative than that though. I'm gonna say 12%. This is because panels get dirty, they uh, lose a little performance over time, uh, as we start manufacturing them at a larger scale, they may be lower efficiency for all, a number of different reasons. I'm going to go with this more conservative number. So we're now down to a circle that is a really tiny circle compared to that monster that we started with on the left side of the screen. But that tiny circle, the amount of energy we could actually get from solar energy is that yellow box. So the feasible solar energy supply is more than two times larger than the total projected global energy demand in the year 2050. In other words, this is an inexhaustible energy supply for us. There is more there than we are ever going to need. Now, I don't say that to mean that we should get all of our energy from solar energy. We should not do that. There are all kinds of reasons we want an energy mix. We need wind, we need hydropower, we need geothermal, et cetera. But the point is there's plenty out there without using fossil fuels. Now, the next argument that usually comes up is, well, things like solar energy are too expensive. That used to be true. This is a plot of what solar panels cost, a dollar for one watt of power you get, you know, per watt of power you get out of your solar panel. Back in the 1970s, if you bought solar panels, you were, you were quite the tree hunter. These were pretty expensive back in the 1970s. But those prices have plummeted. You can barely even see the little yellow bars out here in recent years. It's now below $1 per watt for solar panels. The prices are, are just astronomically lower than they used to be. And in fact, solar and wind are the cheapest form of electricity now. So uh, units here, this is at the kind of utility scale. So now we're talking about dollars per megawatt hour. Megawatts, a megawatt hour is a tremendous amount of electricity. So we're looking at the utility scale here. And you can see solar and wind are cheaper than coal and gas and nuclear. They're literally the cheapest sources of electricity. So even if you don't care about climate change and all you care is about how do you get the cheapest electricity, this is how you do it. Now, another argument that comes up is, okay, but solar energy, wind, these are variable energy sources. They're not reliable. They're not on all the time. And that is certainly true, but the problem is not as bad as it seems. This is a plot of the output of solar plants scattered around uh, Southern California. And if you look at just one plant, say that orange dashed line, 
you can see that as clouds move over that solar array, you get these big jumps up and down in the output from the, from the solar array. That's a problem for someone operating the grid to manage these big ramps up and down and power coming up. But if you connect that plant with another plant and then another one and another one spread out over a larger geographic region, the clouds are not covering all those panels at the same time. And it all smooths out that big smooth curve you see is all of those plants integrated together, connected as one grid. And you can see you get this very nice smooth curve through the course of the day. So that variability is something that needs to be managed, but it is manageable. Now, there's another problem on another time scale with things like solar, though. This is what the electricity demand would look like over the course of a day, in a typical day. It's mostly flat throughout the day, and then everybody comes home from work at the end of the day, and there's this spike when everyone turns on their TVs and microwave ovens and, and so on, uh, and then it drops back down and is flat again the rest of the day. But the solar production, of course, ramps up when the sun comes up in the morning, and then it ramps down at the end of the day. And so as you have a bunch of solar energy on your grid, the electricity demand, the apparent demand, starts to look like this, where you have this big dip in the middle of the day because you're producing more energy than you need, which looks like a drop in demand. And then right when you really want the most energy because demand is spiking, that's unfortunately when the sun is setting, and so you have this big spike that comes. This so-called duck curve, because if you kind of squint your eyes, it looks like a profile of a, of a duck, is a, is a problem for, again, operators of the grid. How do you deal with that big dip and then that big rise? And the way you deal with it is by storing the energy. So when you're getting more energy than you need from either solar panels or wind turbines or what have you, Instead of just dumping that energy, which is commonly done today, you can store it and hold on to it and then release it when that demand comes when the sun sets later in the day and everybody goes home. And there are all kinds of ways that you can store energy. One of the most promising ones and the one that looks like it'll be done at the largest scale is pictured here. These are grid scale batteries. So these are more or less the batteries that you have in your phone or if you drive an electric car in your electric car, but at a much larger scale. And they, uh, in fact, they can be retired electric car batteries because even when they're not good enough to power your car anymore, they're still good enough to work for the grid. This is a good second life for them. Uh, that can be done on a big scale and store that energy. But there's other ways to store the energy. You can compress air with extra energy, hold it in a tank, and then release it and turn turbines later. You can pump water from a low elevation to a high elevation behind a, a dam, a hydroelectric dam, and it'll just sit there. That's a the picture there is a aerial image of what's called the largest battery in the world, the uh, bath pumping station at the Virginia West Virginia border. They just pump water up when they have extra energy. They'll sit there as long as they need and then run it through the hydroelectric dam to get it back later. Beautiful way to store energy. You can also thermally store energy. Take the sun's heat, store it in a, in a fluid like a molten salt, put it in a giant coffee thermos, if you will, and it can hold on to that thermal energy for many, many hours and again, then generate power later. You can also create chemical fuels, and you know, ammonia is a great one to make. You can use the solar energy or wind energy, create ammonia, hold on to that ammonia in a tank as long as you want, and then use it as a fuel later to get the energy out. So this is really a big change. That, uh, almost all big solar installations now are being paired with solar for this reason, or being paired with storage for this reason. Now, an important point here is to, is to show that this does not solve all of our issues. There's more to do. This is where greenhouse gases come from by sector in the United States. Now, electricity, I just showed you a great way to solve that. We move away from natural gas and coal in electricity production. We move to solar and wind and hydropower and so on. That will decarbonize the electricity sector. So we've got a solution there that we can turn to. We've also, in a, partially, will solve the transportation problem. Because as we electrify, we get more and more electric vehicles. As long as those electric vehicles are being powered by renewable electricity, you're also decarbonizing parts of the transportation sector. So what I showed you so far has a pathway to solve those issues. 
but it doesn't solve the entire transportation slice of the pie because you're not going to electrify large trucks or big ships or trains or airplanes anytime soon. We don't have battery technology today that can be applied to any of that heavy duty transport. Those things are going to continue to rely on, on fuel, on chemical fuel. Also, all these things over here, industrial production, our homes and businesses, agriculture, electrification from renewable energy doesn't help us directly with many of those today either, because that's not the way we're using the energy there. So one solution here is one that we can all do, which is try and decrease demand, be more efficient in our demand for energy. And there are many things, many choices that individuals can make in their own lives to reduce their energy demand and therefore their carbon footprint. I've kind of uh, laid them out here on a kind of the scale of how big of an impact they'll have on carbon emissions versus how disruptive it might be to your life. And of course that disruptive axis is subjective. So these are, these are my viewpoints on what's difficult or not. Uh, you know, some people are very happy to, to eat vegan, but uh, you can, I would say that is not a common uh, sense among the, the population in the United States. So that would be a difficult thing to get people to do is to all start eating vegan, but maybe taking no cruises, probably go without going on a cruise ship and that'll have a big impact. So understanding kind of the scale of the impact you can have with these different choices is important. But no matter how good we are on this demand side, demand side solutions are not nearly enough to solve this problem. We need to do all that stuff, but all that does is move the needle a little bit. We've got much harder problems here. And I've got a, uh, a little uh, very short clip here from um, uh, The Martian. I don't know if you guys have seen the, the movie The Martian with, with Matt Damon, but I love this quote from that movie. Let me play it for you. In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm going to have to science the get out of this. That's what we're going to have to do here. We're going to have to science the, the bleep out of this. We need new technologies to address all those slices of the pie that things like solar panels and wind turbines do not by themselves address for us. And there's all kinds of important stuff that people are working on on the research and development side to do exactly that. These are just a few examples. This is not a, an exhaustive list. So one of the big places that we use energy is heating in our homes. And most of that heating these days comes from natural gas. We need to start replacing all those gas furnaces with electric heat pumps. These can be quite efficient. And as long as that electricity is coming from renewable energy, you have now decarbonized heating in homes and businesses. Now, the heat pumps that exist today, though, are not efficient enough to, to really solve this problem at a large scale. So we need, again, more research and development into improving the performance of heat pumps so that we can uh, take a big uh, cut out of that commercial and residential piece of the pie. Industry, again, relies very heavily on fossil fuels for a lot of their operations, especially for making things like steel, which is one of the largest carbon footprint pieces of industry. But there are other ways you can make steel. There are ways you could reduce iron, to get it towards steel, using hydrogen and renewable energy sources through an electrical or electrochemical process. Now, we don't haven't figured out all the ways that to do that today. So again, more R&D is needed, but we can see uh, opportunities to do that. All those parts of the transportation sector, uh, air travel, marine, rail, heavy duty road, off road, all those forms of transportation, remember, can't be electrified. They need chemical fuels, but those chemical fuels do not need to be fossil fuels. They don't need to be gasoline and jet fuel and diesel derived from petroleum. They can be things like hydrogen or ammonia or biofuels, all of which can be produced with a very low carbon footprint. But again, new technologies are still needed to get those to be cost effective and efficient at scale. And cement is a huge uh, piece of our carbon footprint, but there are lots of great innovation going on in the R&D world on ways to reduce the carbon footprint of cement. So, Solar panels and wind turbines are fantastic and we need them. I wanted to show you though that there's lots of other challenges still out there in the R&D world that need to be solved to give us all of the solutions that are gonna to need to come together to solve this problem. 
I'm just going to wrap by showing this image. I like to end all of my climate talks with this particular uh, image. This is an actual uh, photograph of the Earth, taken obviously from space, just as the sun was peeking up over the, the edge of the Earth there. And that blue line that you see getting lit up around the edge of the planet is our atmosphere. That's the actual atmosphere getting lit by the sun. And at this scale, you can see how razor thin our atmosphere is. When you're standing out as a human outdoors and you look up at the sky, it looks you know, gigantic and it's kind of hard to imagine how is it that we change the chemistry of that entire atmosphere to mess up our climate. But when you see it at this scale, it becomes a little more clear just how that happened. It's just the skin of the peach, if you will, around the planet, razor thin thing that we have in fact changed. And now it's time that we do something about it. So there, I will uh, wrap it up and stop sharing, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Steph. And you know that last slide that you have. Many of us, huh, many of us uh, know that slide because Al Gore uses a similar slide all the time, and it, it is very impactful. I do like yours better than it. It's, it's a high quality uh, slide. Well, thank you very much. I hope <clears throat> scotch taping those uh, front end observations and trying to merit with the rest of the uh, actual recording. I hope it helps. Thank you.